Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the public seminar on collaboration for atrocity prevention in Myanmar and beyond. I would like to welcome His Excellency George William Okot Obo, the Special Advisor on the Responsibility to Protect to the United Nations Secretary General. I also would like to welcome Dr. Mazuki Dawusman, member of the Special Advisory Council on Myanmar. And also I would like to welcome Dr. Safia Muhibat, Deputy Executive Director for Research, CSIS, and Dr. Lina Alexandra, Head of the Department of International Relations, CSIS. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, we will, we will listen to the opening remarks of doc, from Dr. Safia Muhibat. Dr. Safia Muhibat, the floor is yours. Very good afternoon, um, everyone, um, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, um, welcome. Um, on behalf of Center for Strategic and International Studies, I would like to uh, welcome all of you uh, and also um, send my biggest gratitude for extending um, your time to attend this event, uh, which we titled uh, Collaboration for Atrocity Prevention in Myanmar and Beyond. It's a great pleasure for us in CSIS to be able to um, host um, this uh, public <laughs> seminar today. So thank you again for coming. Um, it is my honor to welcome uh, Dr. Marzuki Darusman, um, chair of the Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar from 2017 to 2019, and member of the Special Advisory Council on Myanmar as our keynote um, speaker today. Thank you, Bapa. Uh, I would also like to welcome His Excellency George Okot Obo. No? Just George Okot. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mr. George Okot Obo. Fantastic. The Special Advisor on the Responsibility to Protect to the United Nations Secretary General, who will deliver um, his remarks on the topic that we are discussing today. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the continuous support from the Asia Pacific Center for the Responsibility to Protect, or APR2P, uh, of the University of Queensland, Australia. So thank you so much for um, collaborating with us in co-hosting this, this event. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, we did today we aim to discuss uh, a number of things, but I think mainly on how um, organizations like ASEAN, like the United Nations and the international community um, as a whole could work together in atrocity prevention. Um, and specifically today, we are trying to use Myanmar as one of the study cases. Um, it has been two years since the military coup in Myanmar. Uh, which ended a, a previously promising democratic transition and state building process in the country and sparked violent conflict across the country with potential spillover um, to the region. However, even before the coup, uh, Myanmar's human rights situation has been a focus after the increasing atrocities against the Rohingya ethnic group. Um, the situation in Myanmar um, poses a challenge for the international community uh, and ASEAN, you know, looking at it from, from a Southeast Asian perspective, uh, although criticized as having played minimal role, um, did establish uh, the ASEAN humanitarian assistance, which was specifically assigned in the Rakhine state to prevent the recurrence uh, of atrocities against the ethnic group. Uh, meanwhile, the broader international community proposed the implementation of the Responsibility to Protect Principle, or the R2P, uh, that the international community has a responsibility to protect people from crimes against humanity, genocide, ethnic cleansing, and war crimes. This principle, however, has become a somewhat a sensitive notion in Southeast Asia, where the principle of non-interference has become uh, widely um, held norms uh, in the region. So I think it will be interesting for us today to hear and discuss how the principle could be implemented as a means for atrocities prevention, especially in this region in Southeast Asia. Uh, most importantly, um, I do hope that somehow this discussion could become a platform to discuss how global and regional collaboration uh, in this regard, you know, looking at ASEAN and then the United Nations could stop the violence uh, in Myanmar and solve the crisis in the long term. And I think this has been, you know, one of the main focus of CSIS for quite some years now. Uh, and I'm very glad that uh, we get the chance to continue this um, effort um, through this public seminar today. So again, um, I look forward to uh, a very deep and fruitful and meaningful discussion um, with all the uh, keynote speakers today and also with all of you. Uh, and thank you again for, for coming to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Safiyah Mugat. 
Now we, we begin the discussion session. The discussion will be moderated by Dr. Lina Alexandra. Dr. Lina Alexandra is the head of the Department of International Relations at CSIS Indonesia and one of the experts on Myanmar. Dr. Lina, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Farhan. Thank you, Ibu Fifi, for the kind introduction. Um, so this afternoon, I think we are very privileged to have um, two distinguished speakers with us um, today to talk about the possible collaboration on, for atrocities prevention in Myanmar. Uh, basically, I think um, we all know that uh, this year, and particularly this February, is the second anniversary of the coup, something that we should not celebrate, obviously, uh, in the region. And it also happens to be Indonesia's chairmanship this year in ASEAN. And we all know there has been a very high expectations on Indonesia and particularly on ASEAN in, uh, to create um, a breakthrough on how the regional organization can actually um, do something um, to facilitate a better solution for ASEAN. The, the past, the previous two chairmanships earlier um, have tried uh, some efforts in order to um, stop the violence and also to facilitate a uh, certain humanitarian assistance corridor uh, to take place in the country in Myanmar. But unfortunately, it has not been successful. And there has been a lot of questions regarding the five-point consensus, for example, uh, what can be done, whether we should stick to the five-point consensus or we should go beyond the five-point consensus. And uh, early this year, after the foreign minister's briefing, the ASEAN foreign minister's briefing, I think it is very clear, uh, one of the points that uh, Indonesian foreign minister has mentioned is how ASEAN can synergize effort with the other international actors. And she particularly mentioned about the uh, potential uh, engagement and collaboration with the United Nations. So uh, once again, we are very privileged to have um, two distinguished speakers. The first is Dr. Marsuki de Rusman, who is also a very well-known um, expert and practitioner, obviously, in human rights and currently also in Myanmar issue. And we are also uh, privileged to have um, uh, Mr. George Sokotobo, the special advisor for um, responsibility to protect. And uh, we certainly would like to hear um, on how uh, the, the idea to synergize effort between ASEAN and United Nations is something that we can look into um, uh, in the future. Without uh, further ado, I would like to invite Pa Marzuki Darusman to give um, remarks, Pa, your um, key points for about um, 15 to 20 minutes, Pa. Yeah, well, and after that, yeah, after that, uh, followed by remarks from, from Mr. George Sokosobo. Please, Pa Marzuki. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lina. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lina, and uh, thank you, Dr. Muebat, for the introductions. Uh, I would like to start by uh, expressing my appreciation for the CSIS2 for uh, organizing this, this uh, discussion. A timely discussion uh, as Indonesia assumes the the chairship of uh, ASEAN for uh, for a year. <clears throat> uh, when when I was asked to join this discussion, I uh, thought I would be spending a quiet Monday afternoon, if there is such a thing. To listen to the special advisor on uh, R2P. Uh, but it turns, it turns out that uh, different arrangements were made, and uh, I'm finding myself now uh, having to just improvise. Uh, and come up with a, a more or less impressionistic uh, laying out of the uh, of the problem, the situation, as as seen by uh, as was introduced earlier, as was mentioned earlier by a a group of uh, like minded uh, activists who have been engaged with UN work for the last 
decade, perhaps even going back. Uh, who uh, had decided to to stay on after serving uh, time uh, serving uh, the uh, mandate uh, and to reciprocate uh, the the assistance, the help, and the the goodwill that we have been able to enjoy during our mandate uh, from the people of Myanmar and uh, civil society. But the high point came when on February 2021, I believe the junta staged a coup, uh, uh, attempted, attempted a coup d'etat. And that was when we then decided to set up this, this uh, platform uh which we designated the uh, special advisory council for Myanmar to assist uh our colleagues and friends in the country and outside in Geneva and New York to continue uh liaising and uh, act as a conduit of information in both ways to allow uh a, a, a continuing and an updating process to be undertaken uh, so that uh, an understanding could, could be could be shaped out, especially from the international community of what is happening here in, 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 in Myanmar. And so fast forward, uh, uh, it's now two years, we're into our three, third year. Uh, and uh, in the course of the discussion, uh, I'll probably touch on some of the uh, issues that we've addressed. But uh, more to the point, of course, is that uh, as related to the discussion this afternoon, uh, seven months after the, the, the coup d'etat, they attempted the aborted uh, coup d'etat, uh, voices were then, uh, voices came out calling for for the United Nations to put in place a process which was known popularly in, within the country as R2P, Responsibility to Protect. There were discussions about um, uh, no-fly zones, uh, uh, direct uh, intervention from the uh, international community, uh, arms embargoes, uh, sanctions, and all that. Uh, but uh, it never got off the ground, R2P, because uh, for obvious reasons, uh, there was no immediate interest of uh, the effective powers in the UN to to undertake such a such a what is an initiative. And uh, and therefore, uh, it's it's a welcoming uh, uh, what is this uh, development that uh, CSI now has brought up again this this uh, idea, uh, anticipating perhaps a more assert assertive uh, stance to be taken by ASEAN and especially by Indonesia. But uh, then again, uh, requiring a, a, a an understanding of what. Uh, what in, it, it involves and entails. Now, uh, before we get to that, uh, I'll certainly be listening carefully to uh, uh, on, on the on the state of debate of the R2P. But in, in the course of uh, engaging ourselves with the situation there in, in Myanmar, uh, we've come across uh, situations where uh, there was a clear uh, need for clarity on on concepts, and and this involves the, this this uh, relationship between R two P and humanitarian intervention, and and uh, the stage before humanitarian aid efforts, uh, which has in a way created a bit of a perhaps. Uh, uh, confusion as to where the uh, demarcation lines lie 
between all these uh, concepts. Now, what is now happening in, in Myanmar is a stalemate between uh, the, the, the junta and uh, the democracy movement, the, uh, the protest movement, the People's Defense Forces. I won't go into details, but uh, just to uh, give you this, the, the, the latest, of course, in, in terms of uh, where things are at the moment there. Describing it as a stalemate that will perhaps uh, persist uh, uh, for some time, in, for an indefinite uh, period of time uh, in the coming uh, period. Yeah. And therefore, the question, of course, is there is uh, where, where does, where, do, where do things go from here? And if uh, R2P were to be brought up again, could it then create a tipping point towards a, 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 a peaceful solution that's been, that has been called by the five-point consensus? Uh, interestingly, uh, using this term, a peaceful uh, settlement, I believe, uh, of the issue. And uh, uh, whether or not this could then be interpreted as leading to a, a political solution to the situation in Myanmar. Now, I'm uh, aware that uh, calling for a political solution may not be, may not go down well with uh, the uh, democracy movement suggesting perhaps that uh, this could lead to a compromise. But uh, we can go into that uh, eventually, but uh, the point being now is that uh, the junta, and this is a study that we uh, commissioned uh, last year, on effective control of the territory, uh, showing that at the moment, the junta is only effectively controlling up to 20% of the area. And the rest being in the hands of the ethnic uh, uh, organizations, ethnic uh, armed organizations, and the democracy movement. And therefore, uh, legitimately, the 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 government in, in Myanmar is not the junta. It is the NUG, the National Union Unity Government that was set up uh, almost immediately after the uh, aborted coup d'etat in 2021. Now, uh, having said that, uh, our discussion today perhaps uh, also would uh, do justice to the fact that Myanmar has become a forgotten war, yeah, uh, overshadowed by, by Ukraine. And I have the statistics here that uh, perhaps uh, might interest you, that, that uh, a comparison for, of uh, Burma, Syria, Yemen, Afghan, and Iraq uh, during the period of, uh, after the coup, uh, more clashes happened in Myanmar compared to the combined clashes in all the other countries. Yeah. Uh, also in terms of uh, the casualties. Now, uh, as things stand today, uh, the number of airstrikes and uh, clashes in Burma exceed that in Syria. Now, in terms of the internal dynamics, of course, uh, one can make the, the, the inference that, that apart from not controlling any significant part of the territory of the, of the country, the junta is also uh, at the point of uh, realizing that uh, it may take years uh, to overcome the situation. The, the state of play at the moment is that no one side is able to overcome the other one. And, and therefore, uh, we are now at that point 
uh, where I think uh, it's justified to look at uh, solutions rather than to allow things to drift uh, as, they, as, they, as they are today and to allow for uh, the killings and the casualties to continue to uh, uh, accumulate indefinitely. Now, to that uh, issue, of course, uh, one wonders whether uh, there is a way out immediately uh, from any effort that is sourced within the, the, the country. And, and therefore, if there's going to be any changes in Myanmar, it will have to come from outside. Pressure from outside and perhaps capacity from, from within. And how do we de define pressure from outside? Depends on the international community, depends on ASEAN, depends on the UN, uh, which is now gradually coming out, uh, especially in the Security Council, uh, with a resolution for the first time ever uh, calling for cessation of uh, violence uh, in, in, in Myanmar uh, and uh, a pending resolution at the General Assembly to amplify this uh, resolution of the Security Council. But more to the point, I think uh, the baseline, of course, is that uh, if there's anything that is going to happen, uh, much is expected from ASEAN. Uh, and, and therein lies the problem. Uh, over the past two years, not much has been achieved. Uh, the challenge lies with Indonesia to push things along, if it is in any way aware of its, uh, of its uh, what is this, uh, immediate uh, responsibility and challenge. Uh, it has set up a special envoy's office. Uh, we're now into our third month, almost a third month. Uh, there will be a, perhaps, uh, as you will know, uh, the, uh, another, a summit in May and uh, perhaps another one later on. Uh, so uh, our discussion, I think, will be very useful in uh, contributing uh, thoughts and ideas. Uh, to the government, uh, to, to the chairship of ASEAN, as to what uh, could be a feasible course of action going forward on this. And, and therefore, uh, listening to what the special advisor has to say about uh, what R2P uh, could potentially uh, perhaps uh, contribute to to break this this uh, stalemate, uh, of course, is is going to be very very interesting. Uh, now, uh, we can then perhaps also uh, look at uh, how how the uh, five point consensus is going to to serve as as a as a as a baseline for uh, for future action. Uh, but also look into into uh, what uh, could have been done otherwise uh, from the ASEAN perspective to uh, provide clarity of, uh, as to what is really happening there in Myanmar. Uh, describing the situation there as a violent, uh, in, human-induced conflict uh, situation does not quite help in defining what is exactly uh, going on there. And, and therefore, the, 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 the lesson here is, of course, that, uh, that uh, a challenge for ASEAN is to come up with perhaps a, a, a causal analysis of what is, what, what does uh, trigger the, the situation there, and, and therefore start defining uh, who the parties to the to the conflicts are, and therefore try to bring them together together if, if possible, but it can only do that uh, if there is clarity as to what is the nature of the issue there in Myanmar, and 
this uh, discussion uh, this afternoon uh, could certainly contribute to helping to define that uh, problem. So uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's seen uh, from the outside as an ethnic conflict, as a uh, uh, war situation, as a uh, uh, violent uh, conflict between parties. But uh, you need more than that to describe what is happening there. Uh, and that's uh, uh, perhaps is the next challenge uh, for ASEAN. Uh, We'll discuss about possibilities for ASEAN to take on uh, further actions on this. Uh, but uh, I think uh, a, a very uh, fundamental issue uh, for ASEAN to move forward is to conduct uh, what is called perhaps a, a, a due diligence uh, analysis of what is happening there. So I'll stop there and Perhaps uh, then uh, listen to uh, Pa George, who can then uh, continue with our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pa Marsuki. I think for your <clears throat> remarks. Um, well, I think we. It is very clear that uh, well, it is uh, the, the regional crisis here in the region. But definitely, I think it is also clear that uh, what is happening now in Myanmar has become the international crisis itself. And the fact that, um, uh, as Pak Marzuki rightly pointed out, that seven, just seven months after the coup uh, occurred in Myanmar, there has been a significant call toward R2P, despite a different um, understanding about what R2P is. Uh, I think uh, the fact that the, the 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 people of Myanmar has made the open call for R2P to come and save them, it really tells that something needs to be done by the international community. And uh, at this moment, I think we need we really need to pull resources all together from the regional organizations, um, as well as from the international actors. And here, I think it's very instrumental with the UN. We know UN has also um, uh, made um, um, efforts in terms of uh, appointing UN special envoys, things like that. But definitely we, I think, um, uh, because we want to avoid what pa Marzuki has just pointed out, that Myanmar has to become a forgotten war. You know, well, it's forgotten, but really the impact will not be forgotten, especially for 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 countries for, for uh, in the region. So <clears throat> the fact that there is a need for pressure from outside, while we are expecting certain internal change to happen in Myanmar, uh, to to happen is is what we are doing now, in, uh, 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 and we are seeing very much a stalemate now in 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 the country in Myanmar. So now I would like to invite um, uh, Mr. George Sokotobo to share your view as the special advisor of R2P. I know it's not easy, but I don't know. I'm I'm trying to see a silver line here, because to be frank, sometimes for the for the common people, for the ordinary people, R2P is something very far there in the UN being talked only by maybe some uh, officials uh, that are working in the UN, things like that. But with the, the, the immediate crisis that we are facing in the region, I think there's an opportunity to really, um, um, you know, to really see what, what is this R2P? This is a kind of momentum to share what R2P can and cannot do. And, um, you know, to, to introduce more, to mainstream more about this R2P. This is about the responsibility of the state and how the regional organizations uh, together with the international um, community can actually um, help addressing uh, the risk, the obvious, the clear um, uh, risk toward um, atrocities. With that, I would like to invite the remarks from Mr. George, please. George. Thank you so much, really, thank you. And, uh, you know, my brother, when, when I was in school, my trip was always to speak last. 
because after what would happen is um, as in this case i would listen to everything that you have said they would give me the microphone and then i would say i agree with everything that has just preceded me i have nothing useful to add so thank you very much i'm on my way <laughs> i'm going no but of course it was a pleasure to, to hear you and i really have no more than three cents worth which i'll uh, add more really as conversation pieces with you. Right. There is no magic solution to this situation and certainly not from me. I am not an expert on Myanmar. I am not an expert on this region. I work in um, the office of the United Nations called the Office on genocide prevention and the responsibility to protect. Let me just tell you a little bit of how that office is set up. <clears throat> the office has two very highly interrelated parts. The first part of it, which is the overarching part, is the Office on Genocide Prevention, which does the operational work. Let me put it like that, uh, including country situations. Um, the office is headed by uh, Ms. Alison Nderitu, and really, she should be the one in this chair uh, right now if uh, she could have come to this conversation because she is the one who's seized on a day-to-day -day basis with the things you're going to hear me describe to you <coughs> about uh, the Myanmar situation. Then there is the R2P part of the office, which indeed deals with the responsibility to protect. But my job is to um, meet interlocutors discuss more on the conceptual side of things. So when I put it like that, you can already see the limitation. Yeah. But I'm going to try my best uh, to speak to some of the issues, including what is R2P. But let me just give you a caution at the beginning. Of all the situations that I know of in which R2P has become a resonance, perhaps the clearest as to what R2P in that case is, is Myanmar. Why? Because whenever in doubt, always listen to the people. And we all saw the people and what they said. They came out, not only did they say we want R to P, they spelled out what that was for them. Mm -hmm. So in this case, as in others, what a shame it would be if the polemic around the concept and what the concept would mean conceptually then substitutes the imperative for action to respond to those people who emblazoned on their shirts, on the streets, et cetera. No more death, we want peace, we want safety. The inclusive process must go on, the dispensation must go on. So that is the background to the things that I will share uh, with you. But first, in a nutshell, when this R2P concept was adopted in 2005, what basically was it? It basically said the following. In the aftermath of what happened in Rwanda more recently, in the aftermath of what happened in the former Yugoslavia more recently, there shall be no more wanton killing of people in circumstances that amount to genocide. There shall be and should be no more mass murder of people in circumstances that we saw such as in Rwanda and in the former Yugoslavia. In cases where there is strife, there shall be no crimes against humanity, there should be no crimes against war, and there should be no ethnic cleansing. If I just pause there right now, I want a hand up in this room as to anyone who disagrees with this. Not one. Then what else did R2P say? R2P said, the first port of call to ensure that this does not happen is the government of the territory that it has power on and in which it has its own, its own population. Those are the words. Those are the words of R2P. Make sure that the people are safe, that the people are free, that the people have freedom to express themselves, to live their lives, to enjoy their lives, to look to a future in which they can reproduce themselves, their children and families in concept, in, in confidence and in the expectation that it will be a fulfilling life. I have a question for you. Hmm? Give me one example, one, just one will do. 
where you have a national law, especially a constitution, that doesn't say something along the lines of what I have just said. That doesn't say that in this country, people shall be free. People shall have the right to speak. They shall have the, all of their religious vocations. It's, give me one example where that is not the essential way of defining what the responsibility of the public power in that country is. Then Arthur went ahead and said the following, that we, that is the obligation of the country. However, the international community will be there to help and work with you to make that happen, to keep people safe and to create a secure environment for people to reproduce themselves as a nation. That's basically what, if you have had the garbage which talks about pillar two, that's basically what it says. And then it continues and says the following, that in cases where one, the government of the territory in which there is risk or actual occurrence of these four crimes that we have talked about is not able to prevent or unwilling to prevent, the international community shall come into play. Now, this is the place where this controversial thing about intervention, military intervention comes in. And indeed, that part of the responsibility to protect hmm, says that there shall be also one option to engage, and it doesn't talk of, you know, regime replacement, it doesn't talk about interfering with uh, and, and, and subverting a sovereign responsibility. It talks of applying chapter seven of the United Nations Charter, which is not new and has been part of the overall framework of global existence to keep nations and peoples secure and free. Because that part of our begins, as you have said, by talking about peaceful means, mediation, diplomacy, humanitarian intervention, et cetera, all these things before. Once all those have failed, once all those have failed, then the international community shall come into play and help. Actually, that word is used, help make sure that these atrocity crimes are um, either stopped or do not occur. So that I am trying to speak in the most plain terms as possible. So how do I correlate this to the Myanmar situation? Number one, the entire leadership of the United Nations, the Secretary him, General himself, consider Myanmar as a priority situation and a critical situation. The Secretary General, when he was in from Penn in uh, November, repeated these words. He specifically reiterated that the situation that was going on in Myanmar could amount to crimes um, um, against humanity. He said this. The Undersecretary General who heads um, the office that I just mentioned to you on the prevention of genocide has said this several times. Uh, that office has issued statements describing that situation of both at risk of and already featuring activities which could lead to the risk of the occurrence mm -hmm. of crimes against humanity and indeed even war crimes. Mm -hmm. That office has supported the actions which are being taken for international judicial um, um, enforcement, mm -hmm. the investigations of the ICC, the measures that have been taken place in terms of ICG, ICG jurisdiction um, in, in relation to the genocide convention, et cetera, et cetera, I could go on. But as we have heard, there is a stalemate. Mm -hmm. There's a stalemate and have been asked, does R2P help? And if R2P helps, what could it be? So this is what I'm going to conclude on and put some three or so discussion points on the table. The first one I've said is that for the people of Myanmar who have actually said, we want r they were not talking about we want r They were talking of it must end. Please end this. Hmm? Stop the mass murder. Stop killing us. 
this is just way too much. Hmm? Someone stop this. And the first place in which they were expecting this to happen hmm, is not even here at regional level, and it is certainly not at global hmm. level. It is in the entity that was sitting in front of them and owed them this responsibility to deliver something safer, more accountable, the government of their own country. So the answer to the question, what is our country? What, what does it bring to the table? The answer to that is it is what the people are asking for. And let it not be turned into a polemical, conceptual, hostile discussion about which concepts when what is in front of us is being asked and is being laid out. This is really the first thing that I would like to say. My second point is what the Secretary General echoed in November in uh, um, Cambodia in the um, ASEAN meeting. And it was really this. The Secretary General, uh, in summary, he said two things. The first, that following what he had just said about this situation in Myanmar and the threats that it represents, first and foremost to the people themselves, but to the region and globally, that the transition back to a democratic dispensation in an inclusive way should be supported very, very critically to happen. And secondly, he specifically supported the five-point consensus. And there are other things, but these are the two that I would like to uh, take up. And in this, as uh, you mentioned, um, he um, um, recalled, obviously, um, the, um, his, his special envoy and asked the special envoy and ASEAN to work together to develop a coordinated plan and to move forward. And that is what the Secretary General said. So to this, sir, what would I like to add to what you have said already? Because you say, and that to me really is ultimately what it's all about. I put it down and you say, much is expected of ASEAN. And this is very, very important. Because not only is the Myanmar situation a national question, it is also a regional question. And the more that the people in Myanmar and that country would be safe and predictable, the more the region itself would be safe and predictable. In other words, the port of call, the energy, the action, the leadership, the criticality of action that is most urgently called for. And if you were to ask me, George, you have visited Jakarta, what is the message that you would like to leave behind there? It's truly this, that everything at regional level should be brought to bear to create the change on the political transition and on the safety and physical security of the Myanmar. It would be arrogant of me to prescribe that it takes this form and takes it to that form. But at least that framework itself has in particular had a five point consensus. I have read so many criticisms from different angles, this five point consensus. Mm -hmm. Whether or not one would agree with them is not the issue. But on this, the view that I take is it is a glove that is half full, not half empty. And if people, if, you were, if any of us were among the people on whom these uh, bombings, you say, are raining more than they did in, uh, in, in Syria, mm -hmm. the people who honestly would be looking at the part of this that is half full and how it could be made fuller. And that is ASEAN, is what really I would add mm -hmm. in my pressure, in my call to at least make the five point consensus in the terms you agreed yourselves, make it work, make it work. And of course, it's not comfortable, it's not easy, and it will require of those countries that are in fact leaning forward into making the five point plan work, into creating a difference, it will require more require more boldness, more robustness, and so forth. I am not in government, I am not in uh, diplomatic relations, so I do not pretend that just by saying so it will happen, but certainly from my vantage point, that has every support that will make a difference for the lives of the people. 
I have two more and I'll finish. And for this, I want to go back and make um, um, the first general point about the R2P. You know, R2P is about the most extreme aspersions and failures of a secure national space that you could think of. Genocide, um, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, war crimes. So it is, I think, possible in some cases to sit back and say, hmm, that happens over there, it happens there. It does, it's not happening in my country. It will never happen in my country. So this R2P thing, I don't care about it. Those are extreme aspersions, as I've said, but they don't start life as atrocity crimes. How do they start life? They start life as really plain human rights transgressions, mm -hmm. as limitations on um, freedom of speech, as strict measures of even things that may have support, such as criminal law enforcement, mm, as um, minorities issues, mm, especially around land, mm, as you know, the othering of other people, hate speech as we have called it, even before it becomes extreme. And then this incrementalizes until eventually a point of return is not reached. So although in real time, there may be countries, there may be situations in which atrocity crimes are not occurring at that point. And one may say, no, we don't have them. There is no place, there is no country in which there is an absolute safety against the risk of atrocity crimes. So what is R2P? R2P is an imperative for all of us, wherever we are. And it is the imperative of our times. And my last point, and forgive me for taking so much time, but I'll shut up, I'll shut up after I finish this, mm, is really this. Mm. I want to just go to the refugee, the displacement dimension of this. Why do I pick this? I worked at UNHCR uh, for nearly 40 years before I finished and uh, I am now here. And as you know, um, almost 1.5 billion people, uh, million people, excuse me, mm, have been uh, displaced internally. Um, 750,000 in just one country alone in um, uh, uh, Bangladesh. So the forced displacement of people is a very painful and visible manifestation of what this crisis is about. Eh? Because the lives of more than 3 million people have been broken in a very painful and visible manner. So I want to see two things. The first one, a very, very big and strong word of very humble thanks and um, congratulations to those countries, to those peoples who have helped um, provide a place of safety for those who have been displaced externally. I mentioned this because that, when I was working with the Refugee High Commission, is what I saw. I went to Bangladesh several times and there. So this helps provide a space in which people could recreate some conditions of membership to society. But even in the cases where the refugee framework works the best of all in its most fulsome way, it is not still a reclamation of life. And ultimately, it is only safe, secure return back to the countries in which people have a citizenship and can fully reclaim it that provides the true completion to that circle, both for those who are displaced externally as refugees and those who are still displaced internally. So for that, I consulted my colleagues uh, who in UNHCR because I'm not there anymore, so I do not speak now on behalf of UNHCR. And they said the effort, the work still continues for what? For two things, that those Rohingyas who are still outside as refugees continue to find safe and secure asylum and the efforts of the international community as a whole continue to create a place where um, people can return to their homes, both from within internal displacement camps and outside, but to underline in conditions of safety, security, and the ability to reintegrate and reclaim a life and a livelihood. Thank you very much for listening to me.
Thank you very much, George. I think very important points that you that you raised, and certainly you used the opportunity to hear to actually um, uh, remind us about uh, the importance of R two P, which is actually imperative for all. Definitely, we shouldn't think that uh, that the the crimes are happening somewhere, and it, it will not affect us. It will not happen uh, in our country. And so this is something definitely we we need to um uh, to to work on. And here you mentioned about the role of international community to remind and assist state to be able to perform this responsibility. And in this respect, uh, you have elaborated on how um, the UN actually made um, 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 a lot of attempts as well. Um, and even uh, the Secretary General already declared that the situation is actually already um, um, consist, uh, consists of the crimes against humanity, what is happening in, in Myanmar. And uh, I think it's very encouraging when you say that the call for R2P actually made by the Myanmar people is not something in vain. It's actually the, the really the call uh, uh, to the international community, to the regional uh, community to, to stop the atrocities, that it should not happen any longer uh, in the country. Uh, that, that certainly requires all our effort together. Uh, we need to pull uh, resources together on how to, to deal with this crisis. Uh, so with that, uh, we have around uh, 50 minutes, a bit less, for questions and answers and comments, um, definitely from the floor uh, to the, the distinguished speakers uh, in front here. Please uh, kindly identify yourself, your name, your institution, uh, and also just state your question and comment um, directly. So I see hands here, one, two, three. Okay, I take three here first, one, two. Anyone, uh, one more over there in, in this side, if there's any? Yes, one, okay. Uh, we go for the second round. So three from here and three from there. Okay, you go first. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Rio. I'm from uh, UGM, Universitas Gajah Mada, a postgrad student. Uh, First of all, thank you for Mr. George. Uh, it's a very, uh, you know, uplifting uh, uh, speech that you sent there. But there's uh, a certain question because you mentioned about what do the the Burmese people want, and the question is is which Burmese people? Because uh, as uh, I'm sorry, I I forgot to. Pamarzuki. I sorry, I said that. Uh, Juta only uh, only controls about twenty percent, and the U NUG is about eighty percent. But in, even between the NUG government, there are still rebel group, rebel groups, armed rebel groups that uh, I don't know uh, if uh, if this accountable or uh, true uh, true or not. Uh, but they are uh, allied themselves with the NUG, and I can tell you that there are no armed rebel groups in the uh, in every conflict in this world that wanted R two P. So. Yeah, the question is about uh, that. Which people, which Burmese people that we uh, the, uh, that wants have to be, and how do we contact them? How do we establish a legitimate? Even we have more, even if we have the moral justification, we don't exactly have the uh, legal uh, the legal justification, uh, uh, whatever the term it is, to enter uh, enter Myanmar to help these people without. Uh, proper channels or whatever the, the term it is. I, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, second question in front. Yeah. Uh, my name. My name is Rep, uh, my name is Rep Park from the Blue Pants Labs. Uh, this question is for uh, Mr. Marzuki. You have a really great remarks regarding the um, situation regarding the your uh, updates uh, regarding the situation on Myanmar. However. Uh, given your experience and also your personal judgment, uh, in what kind of mechanisms in which that it is um, it is suitable for the uh, for Myanmar-led discussions um, to be taken uh, to be uh, to produce uh, fruitful results? For example, like if we can take like examples like back in days like uh, Indonesia media is between. Um, all the legends in the Cambodian within the Cambodian uh can be Cambodian conflicts uh back in the uh back in the, the 90s and 80s so do you think that the uh, Bogor informal meeting format or maybe Jakarta informal meeting format will be suitable for uh, to create a power sharing mechanism uh, power sharing arrangements in terms of between the NUG 
EAOs, and also uh, Tatmado, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kiro Shields from the Asia Pacific Center for Responsibility to Protect. Uh, thank you for the talk. This is a question that's more conceptual, George. It's it's really to you. And I was thinking about that difference between API, uh, sorry, R2P being taken up by peoples rather than states. And R2P not only is it something political, speaks to IR and the rest of it, but it's also philosophic. There's something at the heart of it that's um, I don't know, empathetic, right? It's empathetic, sympathetic, and therefore it appeals to both people, civil society, but civil society organizations. And I, I think that's why also to some degree it doesn't appeal to states because the states at their core don't have a sort of empathetic philosophy behind them. There's other considerations. So I'm just wondering how conceptually, how you begin to imbue states with that tokenistic or whatever it is, or that philosophic aspect, how you bring empathy and sympathy into the state and then sell R2P to the state that way. And I, my, that was just an observation due to the fact that so many people in, in Myanmar had taken up the cause, had taken up the call for R2P and why that appealed to them. Thank you. So, Papa? Thank you very much. I am Iskandar Hatrianto from Kenari. It's secondary stand for Kepentingan Nasional Republik Indonesia, National Interest uh, Syndicate Group. I'm a retired diplomat. Uh, my question is uh, almost similar to the second uh, question. It's, uh, is there any, because uh, Mr. Okotobo mentioned two things. George, George it's fine. <laughs> two things, George. You mentioned two things. The nature of conflict. And the second thing, I know they've done, interlocutor. That is the key word. We have the international organization, we have the regional organization. Why don't now we push forward our effort to create such kind of mechanism, even though the nature of the conflict is totally different to compare with Cambodia, but we can also create such kind of, uh, let's think out of the box, uh, such kind of uh, maneuver, to contact the three, so-called the three faction, the NUG, Tatmado, the, the, the Hunta, mm -hmm. and the, the, the rebel group, so-called, or the uh, independent movement, to sit together and to discuss, do you want to continue the war or do you want to make peace and then make a reconciliation between these, two, these three conflicting parties like what we discussed in 1989 in the Jakarta Informal Meeting 1 and 2. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Pat. Next, Devap. Um, good afternoon. My name is Matthias. I am independent research here. According to the news that there are 13 countries in Myanmar that are supporting the defense uh, like, you know, something like MAC. Uh, so the budget of the military in Myanmar are 3.8% GDP compared to Indonesia is, uh, of course, Indonesia only 1.5, but the, the number of people is about 8 million defense budget compared to the Myanmar only 3.8. Uh, whether this contribution of the Western country is they are not even, they are still supporting the production of that. Uh, the other question is to Pak Matsuki, Dr. Matsuki, what are the lessons to be learned? Because Indonesia has been, during 1965, has been killing about around 500 murders including recently on the Papua, that has been continued, is roughly 100,000 Papua, uh, whether they are voicing for their, like, you know, currently they don't want to be split of, uh, by province, but, but some of the people that voice that also being okay. killed or even arrested in mass. Yeah. So is it, is it any what the media are saying because of the ratio 
uh, by the police. Okay. Uh, what are what what are the things to do, Pak Masuki? Okay. Because I think you also one of the help server yeah. for, for Indonesia. And what are the things to learn? Okay, thank you so much. Um, one more at the back. <clears throat> right. Hello, panelists. This is Wafa from CSIS. So I think my question is generally about in the same sense, sense of the other questions, right? So I think for Myanmar, the puzzle is here, right? Um, when, when talking about R2P and Myanmar. First, that is, R2P is um, generally directed to a sovereign, a state, usually as, as the party responsible for their people. So, and, and then second, in this region, there's a variance in the, in the uh, regional norm where the entry point of international norm aid involvement um, depends on the invitation and the consent of the state, the sovereign, again. However, in Myanmar, in terms of uh, sovereignty, authority, we don't. We have yet to find a clear representative of this entity, of this sovereign, of this state, at the moment. So uh, my question is: I fear that the only pathway for the region or for the international community to find progress is only when such party emerges first, like this, the sovereign that we can uh, find accountability for. Do you see that is also the case? As uh, and 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 because at the moment. There's still me, there's still um, a party um, controlling 50%, the other controlling a certain amount of percent. So we, don't, we have yet this one party that is supposed to be the sovereign and the state where, where we are supposed to um, take accountability for. Do you see that as also the case? So the second point, um, you talk about, uh, uh, George, um, um, my fear about R2P is also who is to enforce them, right? And chapter seven talks about a security council. And as you know, security council at the moment is, even so, even for Myanmar, right, we, we have seen the split. So do you think that uh, there's, there's, there's a party that can enforce R2P at the moment? Thank you. Thank you very much. So Pak Marzuki, you wanna take up the uh, first? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the questions. I think they are very interesting questions. Uh, starting with uh, which people? Uh, well, it's the people of Myanmar, uh, Myanmar I suppose, uh, those that, that uh, are now resisting uh, the, the, what is it, the violence and the atrocities committed by the, the, by the junta. On a daily basis, uh, there's uh, a continuing assault on, on, the, uh, on the public, on the people all over the country. Uh, again, the, the number of clashes uh, on the civilian population exceeds that in, in other uh, flashpoints uh, across the, the Middle East. Uh, the point here being that uh, at the moment, uh, it depends on how serious uh, the neighboring countries are in, in trying to do something there in, in Myanmar. Uh, if you go out from the historical, the short history, uh, following the coup, the setting up of a governing entity uh, designated as the National Unity Government, complemented by uh, a noble arching National Unity Consultative uh, Council. Uh, you have the beginnings of a, of a uh, structure that is legitim legitimately representing the people because it continues on from the previous election in 2020, uh, which the National League for Democracy won in a landslide election, which uh, on the eve of a, a parliamentary session opening the, 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 the new parliament, uh, a coup d'etat was then committed by the uh, by the junta, 
disavowing the uh, the legal and and uh, three elections that took place under international observation uh, for and for a re for reasons that uh, continue to to uh, to mystify people. Uh, uh, other than that, uh, that uh, the the twenty twenty elections uh, definitely uh, could lead to a complete displacement of the armed forces from politics in in Myanmar, and therefore that was the the only re reaction that the armed forces could take, and that is to then uh, take over the country forcibly. Uh, through a, an, an illegal and, and unconstitutional uh, uh, method. Now, uh, so if we talk about the people, then uh, it, it cannot be the people uh, in an abstract sense. It's it's the people that uh, continue to be there uh, outside of the reach of the junta because of the protection of the ethnic armed organizations in the regions. But uh, I think it's important to understand that that uh, you mentioned about rebels. At no point in Myanmar history, in Burma history, has there been any separatist groups wanting to break away from the union. Yeah, so that needs to be that needs to be uh, the baseline uh, if we are going to analyze uh, uh, Myanmar. So talking about so uh, uh, qualifying groups as rebel groups, uh, these are uh, what is this designations that do not do justice to the overall cause of what is happening there. So if if you if you uh, one asks which people of Myanmar, it is clearly the people who are being represented by the NUG, and that therefore, uh, if there's going to be any settlement, then uh, the immediate uh, requirement is to create a level playing field among the parties to be able to get together, come together, and to discuss the future of the country as a whole. Now, we are at a crossroads now in, the, in, in terms of uh, I'll just bring this out, and uh, this has to do with the issue of recognition of the NUG. Uh, Indonesia is finding itself at a very uh, at, at the crossroads uh, in, in 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 that sense, uh, and that if there's going to be any traction of efforts to bring these parties together, it will require ASEAN's recognition of all parties. Uh, to the conflict. And that is the essence of the five point consensus. It says all parties. It doesn't qualify the junta, it doesn't qualify uh, a specific uh, group, but it uh, requires that all parties uh, sit on an equal uh, status to be able then to uh, sort out these, these problems among themselves. Now, uh, the point here now is that uh, there is a lot of misgivings as to what could then uh, be the consequence of uh, recognizing the, the NUG. Uh, the government uh, of Indonesia will have to take a lead on, on uh, pushing things along in, in Myanmar. And that will require uh, Indonesia to push ASEAN to invest much more in its, in its capacity to analyze the situation in, in Myanmar. Uh, it will need to, to be able to pinpoint exactly uh, the the effective cause of what has caused this conflict, and that has been something that ASEAN has tried to evade until now, defining the situation there as a as a fuzzy 
uh, in human induced uh, violent uh, situation uh, without defining what exactly uh, is the role of a mediator uh, eventually in trying to get all these parties together. So that is the immediate challenge. Uh, if uh, there's going to be any progress in, in resolving the uh, situation in, in Myanmar. And uh, that, uh, of course, uh, can be done in a variety of ways. Uh, isolation of Myanmar, putting greater pressure on its, uh, on its uh, what is its uh, role in, in ASEAN, which is which has happened now, uh, the uh, degrading of uh, Myanmar's presence in uh, foreign ministers' meetings, but it has to come. It has to then uh, also take place across all other ministries. So uh, a challenge uh, for Indonesia is perhaps, uh, and this may have to be brought out, and that is that there needs to be a single uh, a consensus on a single policy on Myanmar in this in, in the government, which unfortunately is not the case. Uh, and, and therefore this is the immediate this is the immediate uh, challenge for uh, for the government and, and that is to align all the other ministries to put pressure on on Myanmar uh, showing the, the, the world that that uh, it, it is it is serious in uh, trying to uh, tackle the situation there and therefore uh, what the question now, of course, is whether uh, anything can be done uh, in in uh, trying to intervene there and to uh, to effect a, a peaceful uh, solution to the uh, to the part to the what is this uh, situation there, and uh, and therefore, if Indonesia is going to mediate and to act as interlocutor, uh, it, will, it will have to uh, uh, what is this, uh, acknowledge the realities that uh, even the party inside the country, the junta for, its, for, 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 for uh, itself, is seeking uh, what is called a political solution uh, by calling for elections. And, and therefore, it would seem to be the, the case that it is now uh, uh, what is this, opportune to try to somehow craft uh, a negotiated transition for Myanmar on the basis of the five-point consensus, which explicitly says a peaceful solution, not a military solution. And so if, you, uh, if, if this is uh, the, the track to be taken, then I think there is hope that within the, this year, a durable solution can be found to lay down the ground for an, for an internal process in Myanmar uh, for the Myanmar people themselves to seek a solution to their problem. But it needs, it needs uh, clearly uh, intervention from outside in terms not of a military intervention, but uh, all the, the ideas that are subsumed under R2P can be done individually without resorting to this notion of R2P, which may or may not uh, create misgivings about uh, where the limit is going to be drawn here uh, in terms of what George was saying, regime change and all that. So uh, R2P could be, be then in a way exerted as a uh, initiative to pressure the, the junta uh, to then uh, come to terms with the reality that they will have to deal uh, with the existing resistance. 
And on the other hand, the resistance will have to also come to terms with the fact that the junta will have to be part of the solution. Now, that is a big jump to take at the moment. Yeah? But these discussions are very important to get to that stage where these discussions can be done openly, including with the uh, resistance forces, but also with the junta. So uh, what is to prevent for, for, for Indonesia uh, to come out and recognize all parties calling publicly for the junta to recognize and also on the other side for the resist resistance to, to, uh, to uh, be aware that uh, at some stage, and this is the stage that we are in now because of the stalemate, that a breakthrough will have to be done and that a solution, whether you call it a political solution or a peaceful solution, will have to, to be crafted. Now, one last point on the Rohingyas. Yeah? Uh, two years ago, the Rohingyas were known as a community. In the meantime, they have become aware and much more conscious of their self-identity. Last year, a charter was issued by the Rohingya community that they were a people. The next stage, there will be a Rohingya nation. And when that comes to that point, there will be territorial claims. And that will be a nightmare for Myanmar. That is a lesson to be learned. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, I agree fully with everything that has been said before me, and I have very little else to add. But such as it is, let me go back to my brother's first uh, question there about, uh, I think, the way you asked it, that um, which are the Myanmarese people who want what? Mm -hmm. um, again, obviously, um, I am not going to give the response to you on the basis that I did an actuaric survey myself. So I know the people who were speaking on Monday were these and so forth. What that was about was really to say this, that those people who were saying that we are exposed to the risk of violence, we have been shot us. What is happening in our community <laughs> is what the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the time called a textbook case of ethnic cleansing. That what is happening is what the international community is warning eh, as could be or even is um, the risk of uh, crimes against humanity. Eh? What has resulted in a decision to ask for investigations of these crimes to be investigated? that what those people were saying, let us not reduce it to a discussion of what R2P is, but listen to what they're saying. Now, someone could well say, no, I have carried out an investigation and it is not true. Hmm? Or indeed, I know that there are others who have a different view, that I, I would grant that. My point was, and this is both in the case of Myanmar and in general, is let us not appropriate the badge and make it the issue and diminish what it is about. In all these cases in which R2P becomes a contention, once you look at it in terms of what actually is the situation itself, it is usually very clear, at least in terms of the harm that there is risk of or actually usually occurring. That was really my point. Mm -hmm. And Creel, it also really is my answer to you, is that I really do not think that those people who were holding up these placards at the head of which was R2P, but beneath which they spelled out actually what it was, that they were making a general philosophical point. Mm -hmm. 
they were saying, look, this is what is happening to us. Mm -hmm. This here is what is happening. It is hidden in plain view. Please do something about it. Do states contend R2P? Of course, but not because really it is R2P budget, but because the world of both domestic, regional, and global political competition is a contested world. And today, there are still people who question the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Hmm? They are, um, you, you see where I'm going with this? Yeah. Hmm? Yes. Hmm? So it just comes back to this point to me that, and what are this, I'm sure you can see some responses to your question as, as, as well. Hmm? That let, what, what was it when really in, in, in 2005, it concluded this process that had um, resulted in an 100 page report of the International Commission. What was that commission saying that became branded R2P? People should not be wantonly killed hmm? in mass murder. That's really what they were saying. Hmm? That the cases of ethnic cleansing that we've seen, particularly in the former Yugoslavia, collapse and so on, that is unacceptable. That crimes against humanity and war crimes this we say again today, not for the first time, but we say again today that from this day onwards, never again. Now, if you put it like that, irrespective of what you branded, let us say it was not branded R2P, who would argue about that and why? Mm -hmm. That was my point, which brings me to what has, let me come to you and then I'll come back. So you said, uh, or your question to me was framed in terms of, R2P is directed to sovereigns and sovereigns have to accept and to agree. Therefore, you continued on to, in the case of Myanmar, in view of these contestations, who is that sovereign and so forth. I think what we had mm -hmm. here answers that part of the question. But I want to go back to the first part of what you said. It is absolutely true that especially in not only philosophical, but also normative and doctrinal arguments, this all become part of it. That, that I can see. And one person will make a very strong argument that no, 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 no. In the specific form in which R2P was instrumentalized as a norm, it's not sufficient because it is only a resolution of the General Assembly and so forth. So that is not fine. But that as an argument we could make. There's also an equally strong argument which could go along the following lines. That behind everything that is said in those three paragraphs, no, actually the first two, 138, 139, let's just pack one photo for the time being, stands solid, conventional, and customary law. Mm. Before the summit, uh, um, the, the World Summit said what it said in those two paragraphs. There is a strong, solid, conventional international legal regime that not only says genocide is unacceptable, but that it is punishable in international law, and that what paragraph 139 says, including the prospect of hostile international use of force, as stated in that paragraph, is already stated in the Genocide Convention. If you look at international humanitarian law in regard to crimes against humanity and uh, 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 war crimes, it says everything that is said in those three paragraphs in conventional binding terms. But I think we should not be frozen in polemics and argumentation. Mm -hmm. The most important thing that those three paragraphs say mm -hmm. is the outcome that they want to see as the standard for the behavior of international uh, of nations in the international space. And that is not kill people, keep people safe. 
and it is first and foremost your responsibility as a nation state. R2P does not contest, does not vitiate, is not hostile to sovereignty. It does exactly the contrary. It affirms and calls for the demonstration of responsible sovereignty. It says so plainly. It is its first pillar. And indeed, even the second pillar of um, uh, R2P calls upon the international community to provide support to the nation in realizing the uh, responsibilities that will ensure the safety of its people. And even this controversial um, uh, third pillar, in which there is, as among its many options, the possibility of um, uh, coercive measures, doesn't begin with coercive measures, it doesn't begin with intervention, it begins with non-coercive measures, all to be directed to helping the state in which these things are happening. So that I think really is at least where I would like to um, end and reiterate with it. Mm -hmm. Namely, that it is about a responsible form of sovereignty, it is about normative obligations which have been long established in conventional law and customary law, speaking in legal terms. They are political terms, they are social terms as well. I accept all that. And that finally, our entry into the discourse about R2P should not be defined by this, the, the, the coercive option that is also included in it, but the thick middle of the pyramid which is comprised in peaceful, friendly, supportive measures to support a responsible sovereignty at home in, make, in ensuring that people are safe. That is what I continue to urge and will continue to urge, and I sincerely believe that that is the construct of what RUP is all about. Thank you so much, George. Uh, yeah. You know, can I just uh, sure, sure. quickly? Uh, this is this is uh, very important. Yeah, not to be not to be misled uh, and to be distracted by this uh, polemical issue of uh, what is or what is not R2P. But the fact remains that uh, you may have noticed that I have sidestepped the accountability issue, sidestepped the issue of uh, atrocities as such. There's such a. Uh, what is this? Uh, a long story to be told about that. But uh, uh, to be clear, uh, what is what has happened in Myanmar fully qualifies uh, what the R2P is intended to achieve. It meets all the criteria for an R2P to be initiated on Myanmar. War crimes crimes against humanity, and genocide. And this, this needs to be spelled out by ASEAN so that the junta is aware that people understand what is happening there. And that is additional pressure on the junta. And only ASEAN can do that. It has to come out with a, with a, uh, a causal analysis. It has to come out with a legal analysis of what is happening there. And it has to come up with a contextual analysis of where to, to, to uh, push things along towards a solution. Bring it out. And, and that is the, the, the whole, I think, uh, challenge for Indonesia. And that is to push ASEAN along these lines so that for future reference, if things happen again in another, another country, then there will be a, 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 an automatic SOP for the ASEAN to come up with a final determination of what is happening in the country. At the moment, there is no such a thing. And that is why ASEAN is losing its way. Thank you so much. So if you can uh, share just one um, very direct uh, because we are running out of time, but sorry. So I just, I can only entertain one question. Okay. 
I, Please. Thank you for the talk. My question is for, for George. It doesn't relate to Myanmar, but I'm just uh, wondering why R2P was used in uh, Libya, but not in, in Syria, given the similarities in, in context. Okay, thank yeah. you. But Susie, if you, if you, uh, your question is really sh like direct, please. Uh, I think uh, somehow, uh, uh, the UN is kind of like outdated by the new norms that are imbibed by a lot of countries because they distrust the international environment now with the rise of nationalism with all the intrusion of different countries so it is more likely for marzuki mm. to come up with a solution of calling everyone rather than using international norms that are not considered legitimate anymore okay thank you so uh, I would ca call George to uh, make it, this is also the final statement uh, and Pat Marzuki later on also as final sta statement to conclude our session. Please, George. Yeah. yeah, why was R2P used in Libya and um, not elsewhere? Hmm. So first in the Libya case, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Mm -hmm. And especially when so much went wrong, and especially when, as a lot of respected scholars and so forth have argued, that um, in addition to the plain and obvious indicators of the risk of atrocities, because that that was clear that the Libya situation was also then abused and misused and so on for non r 2 p gains. I, I can see hmm, why this argument will never go away. Hmm. And I have said ever since I came to this function that for r 2 p as a concept to really move forward, it needs to disabuse itself of the what I call the ghost of Libya, because it will never go away. It needs to be put in a place where these double standard type cases, because that's what you're saying, hmm, can be answered in a straightforward and clear manner, yeah. and so on and so forth. But that does not bring in question not only the importance, but in my view, the imperative nature of R2P mm, in terms of its content. Mm. And that taking that moment to regroup together what the international community had said already before then around these four abominations was absolutely the action of the moment that was called for. And that in fact, what we owe our to be in my view, even as we continue to make it clearer and more predictable for everybody, is to work even harder on its implementation. In both cases where there is risk and certainly in those cases where those abominations are taking place. I say this as a citizen of the world, and I say it as someone who has come from a region, including in my own country, where my people, my relatives, my fellow countrymen and countrywomen have gone through moments in which not only have these abominations occurred to them, but there was no safety net immediately that could come with the effectiveness which R2P says, not before it gets to um, um, the Security Council, but when it talks to the governments of the countries in which these things are occurring, that please keep it safe. That is what I'll continue to urge because I think that that is what is called for. And to my sister about the UN being outdated and so on, I, I would just say two things. First, I think anything which is outdated, wherever it is, needs to be refurbished <laughs> and made <laughs> relevant for the time as a general principle. And if that happens to us, no, absolutely, that should be the case. Hmm? I would think, though, 
that when it comes to R2P, R2P is the principle that maybe perhaps actually its problem is not so much that is outdated, but probably ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. Because what it is saying is, you know, we are not contesting sovereignty. We are actually saying sovereignty has to be responsible. And maybe we are not there. Mm -hmm. And that's where we should be. Mm -hmm. That we should not be in a place where it is said what should be supreme is a doctrine which says, because this is international affairs, international matters occurring within national sovereignty and national space, it gives us the privilege to be wanton and to kill people without interrogation and without accountability. That for me is the principle which would be outdated rather than the one that says we will prod and look into ways to bring it to seizure. I, I can't add much from what George has said in, in, uh, in calling for a, a forward-looking uh, perspective. Yeah? Now, uh, Myanmar has been a problem with the UN for the last uh, 30 years plus. It is now into its fifth or sixth special rapporteur, uh, and it is in the category of uh, North Korea. Uh, for all we know, this could just linger on indefinitely. But uh, I think there's hope that uh, sooner or later, a solution can be found because uh, uh, there needs to be a uh, mindset shift in looking at uh, the situation there from a balance of force now uh, analysis that have been the, the, the practice to look at uh, who is winning uh, at a certain stage, who is losing at another stage. It, it just doesn't uh, produce uh, useful analysis. Uh, the, the first order of the day is to then call for uh, an, an understanding uh, as to what is happening there in terms of a transition rather than than uh, a continuing uh, analysis of uh, from a perspective of a balance of force, a traditional balance of force perspective. You have to redefine uh, uh, Myanmar as a, as a uh, transitional issue. Secondly, uh, uh, there, there is a need to look beyond the conflict there and to start looking at how Myanmar is going to be reconstructed uh, after the uh, atrocities, after the, the violence that, that has taken place there. And that will maybe then bring in back the international community, the international agencies, looking at what needs to be done uh, in the aftermath. And thirdly, perhaps, uh, and this is important, uh, ASEAN states need to realize that they have an obligation uh, to persuade to the utmost for the junta to restrain uh, violence, from uh, committing violence. And that has not been done. And R2P is exactly a call for all countries to recognize that uh, in cases of crimes against humanity, genocide, and war crimes, states are obligated. This is not a moral uh, appeal, R2P. It is, it is a very concrete effort. Now, you could dispense with the label labeling of R2P, but states in ASEAN need to understand that they have an obligation and not to allow things to just take drift, uh, to drift like this. Perhaps uh, then, in, in, uh, Indonesia could initiate a, a regional meeting, a conference, which would include not only like-minded countries uh, in Southeast Asia, not necessarily corresponding to the membership of ASEAN, but a conference that will involve also the big powers, including China, the United States, India, Japan, the whole 
uh, what is this grouping of uh, countries that have interest in allowing uh, in uh, uh, taking action to so, so that peace comes in in, in Myanmar. So uh, it needs to it needs to be pushed forward, you know. Uh, and Indonesia is in a position to do that, uh, if only because it has gone through uh, the same process in the past, and and therefore uh, understands exactly uh, what is entailed in in uh, trying to get a solution in place, so that uh, it becomes no not a uh, what is this a uh, win-lose situation it has to be a situation it has to be a solution that uh, although it may not be satisfactory for all parties but it leads uh, to a solution that is acceptable at this point now that is a big that is a big uh, what is this call to make at the moment but uh, it, it, it inevitably it will have to take that course and, and for that, I think uh, one message for Indonesia is that if Myanmar falls and becomes another country with a restrictive political system as some of the other countries in the region, then the lowest common denominator for protection of human rights and democracy will be put in place. And Indonesia will be threatened in its national interest of developing democracy in this region because it has to adjust to the situation within the region. And that is an existential issue for Indonesia. And therefore, now is the time to act. And uh, I think uh, with all, all the tools we, we, have, we need for that, it just needs leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pak Marzuki. I think uh, we come to the end of uh, our session today, our um, seminar. And sorry for taking much of your time. Uh, we have extra uh, extra time here, but I think we all agree. We learn a lot from the two distinguished speakers. Uh, they are um, in front of, in the stage now. And I think definitely, I think that one point that is very clear is that the situation it's a very unfortunate situation that we are facing in Myanmar, but this is certainly the opportunity to mainstream and promote R2P even more in the region because obviously what, what we are seeing now is the situation uh, toward the serious crimes of um, atrocities that are happening in the country. I think with that note, uh, please join me to give a round of applause to um, the most senior speakers. And thank you for the Asia Pacific Round uh, um, Center for R2P to also um, uh, sponsor this um, event. Thank you and see you all in other CSIS events. Thank you very much.